name is Yvonne Lobby. I'm a public information officer here at the Poughkeepsie Public Library District, and I welcome you this evening. Um, I'm going to introduce Mark. Uh, forgive me for the boilerplate, I just took it from the website. Uh, Mark Spitzer, novelist, poet, essayist, and literary translator, grew up in Minneapolis, where he earned his bachelor's degree at the University of Minnesota in 1990. He then moved to the Rockies, where he earned his master's in creative writing from the University of Colorado. After living on the road for some time, he found himself in Paris as a writer in residence for three years at the Bohemian bookstore Shakespeare and Company, where he translated French criminals and misanthropes. In 1997, he moved to Louisiana, earned an MFA from Louisiana State University, he taught creative writing and lit for five years at Truman State University and is now an associate professor of creative writing at the University of Central Arkansas, where he founded, are you still? <laughs> this uh, might be a little outdated. Uh, well, it's, it, it, the, the literary journal has gone bust, but it's turned into something else. It still exists in a way. Okay. Yeah. Um, the University of Arkansas, where he founded and edited the legendary Toad Suck Review. Spitzer is also a gar nut. The photo, I'm guessing not this photo, uh, is, from the is from the Alligator Gar episode of Animal Planet series, River Monsters. This, this is not the right photo. Not the right photo, okay, let's get bed. Mark currently splits his time between Mayflower, Arkansas and Rosendale, New York and travels the world researching monster fish. So please join me in giving Mark a warm Poughkeepsie welcome, Mark Spitzer. Uh, thank you, Yvonne. And thank you everybody for coming out here uh, during a global pandemic. Um, if you come to the library at seven o'clock at night to see this, you're probably interested in fish. So I'm, I'm glad to talk to you about fish. Um, I, I also want to say I'm not related to Elliot Spitzer. Um, let's see, I write fish books. Um, this is my latest fish book. Um, that fish on the cover is a 17 pound goldfish that I caught in France. It's actually a, a German koi. That was a surprise fish to catch. Um, did, can everybody hear me all right? Okay. Um, anyways, my books are, my fish books are basically um, environmental at heart. That is the look at problems that both fish and humans share on this planet. And uh, I also suggest solutions to these problems. Okay. Yeah, it looks like the image disappeared a little here. Um, when I started writing these fish books, I suppose I started probably back around 2000. Um, my primary research was that of gar, um, garfish. Anybody familiar with garfish? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, here's a picture of uh, my, my first fish book, which is called Season of the Gar. Um, gar are, there's, there's five, well, there's more than five species, but there's five species on, well, the, the largest of the species is the alligator gar. And this fish has an alligator head and an alligator looking head. It has basically armored scales. It can breathe air uh, for a while. Uh, it's basically over a hundred million years old. This fa fa uh, fossil fish hasn't changed much in a hundred million years. They can get nine feet long, they can weigh 300 pounds. Um, so I was, I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and we don't have garfish up there. Uh, we grew up with some mostly, pretty much a lot of the same fish that you have here in New York State. Um, so I got really interested in gar when I, uh, when I went to graduate school in the South. But after I was done with gar, I saw that there was an interest in, um, in monster fish. Uh, particularly in connection to the Animal Planet series River Monsters. And I actually, I was on that show, River Monsters. I was on the fourth episode. They did an alligator gar episode, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, 
So I saw this interest on TV and the internet. And since I'd always had an interest in monsters as well as monstrous fish or weird or unusual fish, uh, fish that people disregard or disrespect or dismiss or think of as grotesque, it just made sense for me to hop on board and write books about freaky fish that provoke the imagination. This gave me a platform to entertain and educate regarding matters of ecology and the environment, which I feel very strongly about. So we're gonna take a look at some fish I studied for in this book, um, my new book, which is In Search of Monster Fish, Angling for a More Sustainable Planet. Um, we won't look at all of the fish in here, but we'll look at those that, I, uh, that I've got pictures of here. Um, I'll talk about what I, what I discovered in researching and catching them. If we get through these fish quicker than expected, I have some images of other fish I've studied for other books, which we can discuss. We'll have time for questions and answers at the end of this talk, but I'm always open to answering questions whenever anybody has them. So if you ever have any questions, you raise your hand or just shout it out. I'll be glad to respond. Um, that way we can get an interactive action-packed dialogue going. Um, so let's let's try the let's look at the first fish here uh, that we're going to talk about. Let's see what happens. Okay. Um, snakeheads and piranhas. Um, this is a snakehead on the left. And those are some fried piranhas on the right. Um, basically, this book starts out in the Ecuadorian Amazon, where my wife, Dr. Leah Graham, and I fished for snakeheads and piranhas uh, back in 2015, I suppose. Um, anybody know anything about snakeheads? Disgusting. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're this eely fish. Um, they look eely, they're long, they're skinny, they got these ferocious fangs. Um, um, they basically broke upon our consciousness right after 9-11, an extremely scary time in American history. Our country had been attacked, especially here in New York. And then we had the anthrax attacks and then uh, following that. And so paranoia and fear of the other was at an all time high. And that's when a bunch of non-native snakeheads, these fish actually mostly live in Asia, Africa, and South America. Um, they were discovered in a pond in Crofton, Maryland. And the media got a hold of this story and they just blew the situation out of proportion. They claimed that this fish could breathe air, which it can, and that they can walk on land, which they can't. That's really something that's that it's a myth but they can wiggle on land and they can breathe air. And so they can move on land and they have been known to get come out of water and go into other cross land and go into other bodies of water. Um, the media also you know, proclaimed that if they got loose, they would decimate ecosystems here in the United States, which isn't really that true because snakeheads coexist with other fish in the, um, in the countries where they do exist naturally. And they've even established a breeding population in um, Washington, DC, our nation's capital. Um, and the uh, people are, are doing a lot of bow fishing for um, snakeheads now in Washington, DC. Um, and they're eating them and they're serving them in restaurants. Uh, it's, it's pretty per ferocious fish actually. They don't get that long, maybe three feet at the most. Um, Anyways, that media attention led to a wrongly deserved and notorious reputation for snakeheads in the United States. And uh, around that time, 2000, around 2000, they just started popping up everywhere. They were found in San Francisco. They were found in Chicago. They were, they were just pop, and they were popping up everywhere because basically uh, people had been keeping them as pets. And, and then they'd throw them out of their aquariums and just throw them into some body of water and then they'd reproduce. And they'd, they'd kill a lot of fish in those systems. Um, but they also got into our waters because they were being farmed for food 
in, in Arkansas and there's a lot of fish farms down there and there's some floods came along and they flooded the ponds and the snakeheads got out. And, um, and in fact, um, I began researching snakeheads back in 2009 during the hugest fish eradication program in history. At that time, snakeheads were loose in about 600 square miles of Arkansas waters and US Fish and Wildlife in collaboration with the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission and various universities we're working together to get snakeheads out of the system by killing everything in whatever water they were uh, suspected of existing in. The, the way that these fish were, were being killed and everything in these systems was uh, a chemical called rotenone, which is made from black walnut, was thrown into the water. And that basically takes out all the oxygen in the water. And um, so everything in there, frogs, minnows, all the fish just die. But that's what, what the governments felt it was so important that we get these fish out of our systems before they kill everything, that they were willing to kill everything in the system. So I rode along on that project. And then after the, 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 the rotenone kills everything in the system, they throw this antidote in the water to, to put the oxygen back in the water. And it turns the water purple. And um, so, I was involved in that. I was just mostly observing and uh, uh, seeing what they were doing. I did not catch this one here that's mounted on, on that plaque. Uh, I bought that fish in a fish market in Kansas City and I ate it and it was delicious. And then I had the head taxidermied. Uh, I later caught one in the Amazon though uh, with my wife Leah while we were night fishing with machetes. Uh, and uh, the guide pointed to a fish that was treading water. And he said, Juan Chi Chi. That's what they called the fish. And he handed me the machete and I chopped it in half. I didn't know that it was a snakehead. And so I reached in uh, to get, to get the, uh, half of the fish. There was two halves of the fish in the water. And I grabbed the head half and it bit the crap out of me. <laughs> um, anyways, we ate that one for breakfast along with those piranhas. Um, the piranha, on the other hand, has a, a similar notorious reputation, uh, which was started by President Teddy Roosevelt, in fact, who took a trip to South America after he was president. And he wrote a book that repeated a whole bunch of secondhand stories about piranhas devouring humans. This led to a lot of fear of the species and the movies that we see today about ravenous biker gangs of piranhas that swarm mass swimmers and all you get left are skeletons. Uh, it's really not that way. Um, the, like the snakehead, the piranha's vicious, vicious reputation has been exaggerated. There are hardly any verifiable accounts of piranha attacks on record, uh, but they are delicious and they have a sort of buttery, mushroomy flavor. So basically what I learned in studying these two fish was um, that we need to think harder about demonizing creatures and spectacularizing their impacts just because there are narratives out there that we want to believe are, are true. I think we want to believe that there are monsters. You know, the kids in us really like the ideas of monsters. Um, but creating myths and repeating rumors can lead to disinformation and a distorted view of reality and can ultimately do damage to the environment. This has happened a lot with sharks, especially with alligator gar and with the next fish that I'm about to talk to you about. But anyways, the take home message with these two fish for I'd say is let's get real and not let our fears affect the biodiversity we need to maintain balance on this planet or else we'll have to deal with the consequences. Um, this fish uh, is the Wells catfish here on the left. Uh, that's the smaller of the two that I caught in Catalonia, Spain. Uh, this fish here was six foot three, 118 pounds. Uh, the, these fish used to reach lengths of 16 feet in the middle ages. Um, these days, it's hard to find one over nine feet long. Um, 
like many of the larger fish on this planet, they just don't get as big as they used to anymore, mostly because there are less feeder fish in the systems these days. And we've overfished most ecosystems as well, thereby shortening the lifespans of such top predators. Rumors have abounded for centuries that Wells catfish eat humans, which has not been verified. The truth is they might be able to swallow a small child, but physically the picture on the right illustrates what would happen if a Wells tried to eat an adult. They just can't swallow it, uh, something that big. Um, anyways, the species in the picture on the right is not a Wells catfish. It's a South American uh, Pyreba catfish. It's a close cousin that's close enough in size to make the point that this would be the result if a Wells tried to eat a full grown human. Incidentally, I tried to get the rights for this photograph on the right. It's, it's a famous viral photograph. It's been all over the internet. I've tried to get that, the rights for that photo for this book, but I learned from Animal Planet that it's actually a photocopied forgery. It's, it's not a real, it's, yeah, it's Photoshop. Um, so when it comes to the concept of monster fish, which is uh, naturally prone to embellishment, we have to question what we see and verify what we see, especially if what we see and repeat could be detrimental to fish populations. Because historically, when there are allegations of man-eating fish, it's not uncommon for lynch mobs to gather. Um, I've seen this with musk lunge and gar, and then people will drain lakes and they'll go after all the fish in the lakes just to try to get the one that they suspect bit somebody. Um, that when, so there's always collateral damage when, um, when people uh, think they, get, they, they gotta get vengeance on a fish. Um, meanwhile, that Wells catfish have been introduced all over Europe. Um, I mean, basically they, they, they started in Germany in the Danube River um, but people have introduced them all over Europe um, for sport fishing. And because of that, ecosystems have rad radically changed in Europe. When you bring in new top predators, you know, um, it just it changes everything from the top to the bottom. Um, debates are raging right now about whether these catfish should be wiped out or proliferated for sport fishing opportunities. They are not any good for eating, but they are respected as a game fish that brings in a lot of tourism dollars. Um, and there's actually a concern that um, they might get loose in this country and uh, change our ecosystems. So there's, there's already some laws uh, about against releasing these fish into the system. Uh, so again, what I discovered is that our narratives, which we create to amuse ourselves, often cause detrimental chain reactions. If we make fish into boogeymen, then stories get repeated and false information gets established as fact. Anyway, the next fish we're going to look at represents the epitome of a species whose slandered reputation is now affecting the balance of all oceanic food chains, which we depend on for protein and sustenance. Sharks. Uh, I caught this seven and a half foot blue shark uh, off Montauk. Did I pronounce that right? Okay. I'm not from around here. And learned a lot about sharks in the process. They're the ocean's top predator and they help to maintain balance. But a hundred million on average are being taken out of the oceans every year and they're not being put back. Imagine that number. It's one third the population of the United States. What if we lost a third of our population every year? Where would we be in three years? Uh, the biggest threat sh sharks face right now are uh, the Chinese elite who are taking them for their fins. There's this belief that sharks have health benefits, but there's no scientific enough evidence for this really. Shark finning is a wasteful and violent practice in which sentient pain feeling creatures are butchered alive. They're, they're caught, the, the, the fins are chopped off, and the, the sharks are thrown back to die. Yeah, and it's all done so that like, um, basically a bunch of wealthy Chinese people can show off by eating $400 bowls of soup, 
which they which are rumored to have aphrodisiac effects but or and other health benefits but there's no proof of that so um there's a lot of misinformation uh that and it's affecting the oceans everywhere um because you know i mean sharks are the top predator and, and we're, there's so many shark species now that that are going extinct it's really incredible i let this one go of course as i do most of the fish i catch so what did I discover in researching the shark chapter? The main thing is that the balance we're looking to maintain in the wild is a lot more delicate than we think it is. Not only does the eradication of the ocean's top predator have a tremendous top-down effect on all the other species in the mix, we're also dealing with everything from global warming to multiplying catastrophic pressures on individual fisheries at this moment. In fact, we're actually on track to lose all wild seafood by the year 2050. That's in only 29 years. This information comes from Science Magazine, which is you know the top tier science magazine. Just Google Science Magazine along with the words all wild seafood in 2050, 2050, and you'll you can see for yourself that it's predicted that we're not going to have wild seafood in 30 years. This is scientists that are telling us this. This isn't me telling you this. This is me just like reporting what scientists are saying. So we've got serious work to do and no time to waste because we are teetering on the brink of an apocalyptic devastation that we can't even visualize. Um, carp, so I went to France to investigate carp angling culture. They have these ponds over there which were formed from gravel pits which were dug up to create concrete for the infrastructure of Europe, for roads, for buildings, for bridges. Um, and so then they had all these, they dug, they dug up these gravel pits for, for centuries, and then they threw a bunch of carp in these ponds that filled up with rainwater, and the carp grew huge and fat over there, sometimes over 100 pounds. This type of fisheries become so popular that it's spread throughout Europe, and it's now spreading into Africa and Asia and, and in Russia as well. Um, the carp in this photo is a 50 pound mirror carp. Uh, they're called mirror carp because they're shiny. They don't have the scales like regular carp do. They're just slimy. Um, and so it's a genetic mutation of the standard common carp which originated in Germany. Um, that carp was caught in one of the many French lakes where people camp for a week and set up like three or four rods on rod holders with alarms. When an alarm goes off, the people jump up and fight the fish. Carp anglers, I discovered, rely on a lot of high-tech equipment and knowledge of knots and fancy baits and designer chums. Their tackle and technology is just as complex as that of our trout anglers here. And because European carp are fed all the time, because basically you want to catch carp in Europe, you throw out a bunch of uh, chum uh, and to attract them. Um, because they're fed all the time, they grow way huger than those in the wild, which is why they're considered one of the most prized sport fish in Europe. In the United States, however, carp are invasive species that have taken hold from coast to coast. In a sense, they know no borders. They just go wherever they go, a lot like the most invasive non-native species on this planet, us. <laughs> we go all over the place, but people hardly point this out unless there are populations crossing borders that people don't want in certain places. So I made some connections like that in this chapter um, about migrations of people and migrations of fish. And I also learned a lot about the technical aspects of catching these sport fish and the cultural significance of carp as a food source in Europe, where it can still be found in the supermarket and as a traditional holiday food staple, especially in Eastern Europe. What's most interesting to me, though, is that carp are not considered a sport fish in the United States, but they could be. I fought world class carp right across the Hudson River over in uh, Rondout Creek and Rosendale. Uh, I've caught them all over the country, and they're just as much a blast to do battle with here as they are in Europe. In fact, when you catch them in Europe, 
they're so big and fat that they just go straight down to the bottom and they and and you, it's like reeling in a log you know but when you catch them here they're fast and they shoot fast and straight and like uh they, they might get up to 60 miles per hour and they're known to leap and do acrobatic stuff here so they, they and, and and mostly it's because they're just big and huge and fat in europe and and, and so they don't they, they just don't got the energy or the to run like they do here i think basically and jump here um let's see anyways um the thing is in europe these fish have a much more respected status when you catch them over there um you you have to use barbalous hooks and you place them in padded cribs so you can extract the hooks and measure them and you go through a lot of pains to make sure that they do not experience pain because these fish are not just like in the wild they're owned by some whoever owns the lake who is making money on renting out spots on the lake to fish um and you you use disinfectants when you catch these fish in Europe. Like when you, if they get scuffed up, you put the disinfectants on the scuffs. If you, if they got a hole in their mouth where the hook went through, you use the disinfectant so they don't get infected. Um, Cause they're considered livestock in Europe basically. But in America, carp are often thrown on our shores to die due to their reputation for destroying the nest and eggs of game fish. But I tell you what, this is an invasive species that we can live with. And they're hardly as harmful as other invasives that have invaded our system. Carp is a word that's often applied to lowly bottom feeders that suck a lot of stuff up and have little food value, uh, which is why it's also been, in, this title has been incorrectly applied to what we commonly call Asian carp, which are the much more destruct, they're much more destructive to our systems than common German carp. Uh, what we have labeled Asian carp here in this country are not actually in the carp family. Those fish are primarily big head carp, silver carp, and black carp. That's a, those are more wrong translations. They're, they're in another fish family. They're not carp. Those fish are highly edible and way more destructive. And basically now they're forcing out the brunt of the biomass in a lot of American river systems. Uh, there's a big fear that Asian carps as they're call, called, will get into the Great Lakes and totally annihilate everything in those waters. But that's another story altogether. One which I examined in the prequel to this book. Oh, did I not bring those? Huh. <laughs> I guess not. Huh. <laughs> Well, I've got things. Let's look at the next fish. Tarpon. These hard hitting monstrous fish can surpass seven feet long and 150 pounds. I supposedly once caught one that size in Nicaragua because according to International Game Fishing Association rules, if anyone on board your boat touches the leader in which uh, a game fish is on, then that fish is considered caught. The idea is the less handling of a fish, the better it gets returned to the water safely. Um, so even though my guide touched the leader on the fishing pole I was holding, and then right after they touched it, the, that seven foot fish got off, I never touched that fish at all. So it's hard for me to really claim I caught it. I don't believe I, I caught that. So, but anyways, back in 2016, uh, Leah and I, we went to the Gambia in West Africa, where I was settling, I wanted to settle my grudge match with this fish, which has been known to explode out of the water and hit people like a missile and kill them. Um, I got the fish I was going for. Uh, it wasn't as colossal as I would have liked, but it was four feet long and 40 pounds. The thing about this weight and size is this is the borderline between juvenile and adult for this species. So I was really surprised when my fishing guides decided to keep this fish to eat rather than let it go. One thing I found from traveling all over the world catching 
massive monster fish is that if you, you take too many juveniles out of a system, then the fish cannot recreate their genes. So the system will weaken and eventually crash, which is what's happening all over the world right now, especially with tuna, whose populations have plummeted between 80 and 90% in the last 40 years, due in part to harvesting juveniles. My major discovery in targeting this fish, however, had little to do with tarpon as it did with the hook I've been searching for in this book. And maybe I'll read a little from the hook. Um, because, you know, what I do is I, 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 I plan all these fishing trips, I go and I study all the science and then, um, and so I'm writing my chapters, but there's gotta be a hook. There's gotta, there's gotta be something to bring it all together. And um, with this book, I found this, I've been reading this other fish writer named Tom, Thomas McGuane, and he wrote something about um, how anglers need to put back more into the system than they take out. And that really affected me. And that was the hook I was looking for. Um, so this is right after I had that epiphany. But what really matters is the epiphany McQueen had led me to. It was the question of putting back more than we take out. Because here we are and our ecosystems are going down. And as McGuane pointed out, we're beyond needing to put back, a fact documented by thousands of scientists who've reached consensus on global warming. Because technically, it is too late. Our ship is sinking, meaning patchwork is our only hope. That's the conundrum of timing. It takes a lot of foresight to get things right. And it takes a lot of convincing to make both fish and people change directions. In essence, we are a species that looks out for ourselves first. And if tarpon have to pay the price for the sins of the industrialized world and hunger in developing countries, so be it. That's our attitude and that's the creed by which we live. But on the flip side, it's not like we're guaranteed more than a century on this planet anyway. As I've been pointing out, at the rate we're going, we won't have any ice caps left in a century. Add to that the reality that we are past the tipping point of a pH level uh, that's ocean acidification of 7.8, plus the fact that all the melting, all that melting ice contains carbon that can evaporate as methane, which is almost 35 times more powerful than carbon dioxide inveiling the atmosphere with greenhouse gases. And we get David Wallace Wells's apocalyptic warning from New York Magazine, which is, we have trapped in Arctic permafrost twice as much carbon as is currently wrecking the atmosphere of the planet. All of it's scheduled to be released at a date that keeps getting moved up. Um, partially in the form of a gas that multiplies its warming power 86 times over. Wallace Wells expects such heat to come stock with severe drought which we're experiencing now, phenomenal floods, which we're experiencing now, dire diseases, which we are experiencing now, imminent crashes in world crops and the human immune system, terrifying plagues of insects, debilitating ozone smog and mass die-offs of marine life from ocean acidification. And as the journal Geophysical Research Letters points out, there are also 32 million gallons of mercury, which is a potent neurotoxin and serious threat to human health thawing out in the Arctic right now. Still, it doesn't have to be that way because we can try to slow our slide. How? By actually envisioning the monstrous results we can't bear to imagine. That is, we need to face the damage we're doing with the intensity of those cigarette packages that show graphic images of blackened lesions and infected gums. Because looking away from what we're doing, refusing to register the consequences of our actions, that's suicide. But back to what I've been searching for, which in effect had just found me, a slap in the face realization that since it's physically and economically impossible to put back more than we take out, we can only give back in other ways. But here's the trouble. It takes activity as an action, as an activism, which is admittedly a scary word, but a word that doesn't have to be scary if you find what drives you and apply it. Like those right now studying biology, ecology, and more eco-friendly management practices, 
like those who are running for office in order to make policy changes from the inside, like those who are marching in the streets or knocking on doors or making phone calls, like those who are spreading the word through music, poetry, video, whatever means possible, and like those who don't know what to do so they're trying to learn, or they're just walking around wondering what the heck to connect with, which is an active form of being lost, and the world needs more of that. Because most of us, we feel too powerless to try to do anything, which is what makes us believe we can't. So that's where I was, stymied on the Gambian sand, gulls squawking in the sky. They were asking me why I shouldn't continue to fish and preach and catch and release and eat some fish on this planet where a bit of timing can make all the difference in getting a tarpon or delaying the unthinkable. And I, now armed with that, was ready to get down to business. Okay, next fish. Mahi Mahi, anybody familiar with Mahi Mahi? Um, can you tell us anything about it? Mahi Mahi. The dolphin. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the dolphin is one of its other names. Um, it's also called Dorado. The, the word mahi mahi is a Hawaiian word, which basically translates into super strong, monstrous fish. And it is a super strong, monstrous fish. When my guides and I stumbled upon a school of them in Senegal, they were tearing up a rotten porpoise. I threw my bait into their midst and they immediately started ripping after it, leaping six feet in the air, attacking it and spitting it out, but never giving up, always going after it and hitting again and again. I caught three of these fish in three minutes. And they were, that's probably a 40 pound fish. Um, they were definitely the most spastic fish I'd ever caught. I fought this one more in the air than in the water. <laughs> the thing about these fish that strikes me the most is that they look like cartoon exaggerations of humans. Of course, it's always strange to see ourselves reflected in creatures. It makes us think of our overlaps and what we need to do to preserve creatures in ourselves, which is what this book is about. I'll read a passage, another passage. When we look at certain creatures, we see ourselves in nature. And if we allow for the wiping out of creatures that look like us, this speaks volumes about how we can turn the other cheek. So when we see ourselves reflected in creatures, we see the roles we need to play in order to sustain ourselves which brings me back to McGuane's thesis of putting back more than we take out. Speaking on behalf of sportsmen and outdoorsy types, I just elected myself for that position. I say that because of the time we spend in the wild and because of what the wild rewards us with, we have an intimate connection with nature. And this intimacy, which stems from the knowledge that we've been blessed by the greatest of all possible outcomes, comes from knowing that nature can save us from ourselves. That is, we recognize a healing faith in our chromosomes that we understand at the cellular level. As my friend, the eco writer, David Gessner states on his Nat Geo Explorer episode, Call of the Wild, science is proving what we've always known intuitively. Nature does good things to the human brain. It makes us healthier, happier, and smarter. He goes on to say, it turns out there's hard science behind this. Researchers have proven that walking in nature reduces stress hormones and lowers blood pressure and heart rates. But they've also discovered something about trees that kind of blows my mind. Some trees like cypress give off chemical compounds called phytoncides. We absorb the phytoncides and they promote our natural, natural killer cells which help us fight cancer. We can experience a 40% increase in our natural killer cells from just walking in the woods. So if there's scientific evidence that being near trees can increase our chances of living longer and healthier, it's reasonable to make the logical leap that our proximity to water can do something similar. Because when it comes down to it, us outsidey folks know that being outside just makes us feel better, which has psychosomatic effects on our physiology. That's just all there is to it. And we know it in our DNA. We also know that our relationship with the wild is a privilege we must defend. This is our responsibility or else we're irresponsible, especially when we know what nature can do for us. That's why I call upon my own kind, anglers, hikers, canoers, mushroom hunters, and anyone else who just has to get out of town to step it up with giving back. But how do we do that? 
Well, we start by taking the time to sit down and have some serious conversations with ourselves. Then we set some goals so that when we look back on what we put back, we'll see our reflections in the mirror and not feel like crap. Those who partake of this challenge will differ in their approaches. Some might shoot to pick up litter, others might vow to revolutionize agriculture methods or discover the next alternative fuel. Some, however, have already been hard at work. According to an article in Fish to Fork, the campaigning restaurant guide for people who want to eat fish sustainably, leading fish distributors and supermarket conglomerates recently called for immediate action to prevent overfished yellowfin tuna populations from collapsing within five years. Bird's Eye Foods, along with executives from 37 other influential companies and the World Wildlife Federation, have petitioned the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission to reduce the harvesting of wild yellowfin by 20% to ensure the sustainability of all Indian Ocean tuna stocks. Imagine that, CEOs actually fighting for balance in the ecosystem. Sure, their main impetus is to keep their businesses going, but here's what I'm looking at. If corporations can engage in meaningful activism, there's no reason why individuals can't do the same. As for me, I'm gonna make it my mission to come up with a more concrete idea about how I intend to put back more than I take out. Because at heart, putting back more is a matter of respect. It's a matter of respecting our place in the world, respecting other places in the world, and respecting ourselves. So in the interest of living up to this challenge, I'm imposing a deadline on myself by the end of the next chapter. This will give me time to seriously reflect and have a productive dialogue with myself. The conversation had begun. Oh yeah, this is um, this is another Wells catfish. This is a very famous one that was caught in uh, Italy in the Po River by Dino Ferrari. Um, he's 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 a school bus driver, and he loves to catch giant uh, catfish. So he caught that one, um, well over three hundred pounds. I think it was ten feet long. Yeah, and it it looks even huger because he's really a small guy. <laughs> but anyways, at this point, does anybody have any, any questions or comments or anything? Did he eat regular taco or did he like tickle it? Oh, yeah. Right, yeah, noodling. Um, <laughs> no, yeah, he, he used some heavy duty taco to catch that one, yeah, yeah. I think something that size might pull you under and keep you under. Oh man, that's, that's one heck of a fish, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Other questions? Um, like I said, you just shout them out whenever you have them. Um, I can go on and show some more fish and do a little more talking. Let's do that. Sure. Okay. Oh, yeah. So these are, um, these are some of my other monster fish books, um, some which I also have here. Which for sale, um, I'm selling them for ten dollars each. Uh, Season of the Gar was my the first full length book about the species ever published in the English language. This book basically works to dispel dispel myths about garfish. Um, and then we have uh, Re Return of the Gar, which is the sequel to Season of the Gar. Uh, which goes into what the conservation efforts are that are bringing gar back from the edge of extinction. We do have gar here in New York State. We have uh, long nosed gar up in, uh, I know they're in Lake Champlain, uh, which are, so these fish can get up to six feet long. Um, you know, they can get 60 pounds, maybe 70 pounds. Um, and they're, they're almost, they're not as huge as the alligator gar, but they're, they're pretty big. And then um, I, I didn't bring any copies of beautifully grotesque fish of the American West, but that is a, uh, that book is specific to monster fish of the American West, involves a lot of immersive experiences uh, going after specific fish with specific environmental concerns. So let's look at some of those concerns. Uh, this is the picture that Yvonne was talking about earlier on the left. Um, 
that's a picture of me with uh, Jeremy Wade from River Monsters. Um, we then well, we caught a six foot eight alligator gar in the Trinity River in Texas. I think it was 124 pounds. Um, so yeah, and then this, let's see what other we got in here. Um, the physiology of these fish make them true monster fish. Like I said before, they can get 10, 9, 10 feet long. They're the second largest freshwater fish on the continent. They can breathe air. They've got lungs, basically. Um, <clears throat> they're, they're armored. They're, they're, their scales are covered with dentine, which is the same stuff that our teeth are made out of. So when the, the French came over, they were shooting musket balls at, at these fish and the musket balls were bouncing off and they called them the uh, poisson armor, the armored fish. And then they've got those, uh, those, those alligator looking heads with the fangs. Um, there's three main myths about alligator gars. The first is that they eat humans, which they don't. There's no proof of that. Um, the second myth is that they destroy game fish populations. If anything, they they help preserve balance in ecosystems by because they eat the um, the bottom feeders that the rough fish that actually do more harm to nests and eggs of game fish. And then there's the the idea that they have no value whatsoever, because that's not true. First, first of all, they can be eaten as food, but these days they exist in systems where they're so old that they've already absorbed so many, so much mercury and lead and PCBs, you don't want to eat any, really. But um, so there, so there, those are some myths that I work to dispel. Um, these myths come from the fact that when the settlers discovered them in the 1800s here, they were totally freaked out. And in a lot of places, these fish were labeled devil fish. And, uh, and farmers worked to expunge them from, their, from the systems. Um, well, farmers, not just farmers, but a, a lot of people were freaked out and they just, just wanted them gone. So there was a lot of um, rounding up of alligator gars and mass killing of them, dynamite, explosions, catch them, throw them on the shore leave them to die. And this lack of respect led to a lot of faulty science. There was a lot of bad science just published around uh, maybe between 1890 and 1940 that wasn't even, just, just relied on a lot of, I don't know, just a lot of, a lot of opinions. Um, and the, the science on this fish didn't get serious until the 1990s. So they've been historically treated really badly. Um, there was this guy in Texas named General Burr who invented this boat called the Electrical Gar Destroyer. And this was like a barge that had somehow rigged up with, uh, with it, could, it could send electrical shocks into the water. And then it had this electric net that would like scoop up all the fish that they shocked. And this guy went around sh shocking tens of thousands of alligator gar and other fish and just, just killing them. And, and this is in the thirties and um, other state agencies started doing what Texas was doing too. And um, I mean, basically people didn't want their kids swimming in lakes and rivers where these fish were, you know, they, figured that the, the kids would get killed, you know, <laughs> but um, we have no, we have to date, we have no verifiable alligator gar attacks on record. There's, there's accusations, but a lot of these have been found out to be sharks. Um, oh, and then in like in Arkansas, uh, where my wife is from and where I uh, teach, um, We, um, we had a, a major sport fishing industry there in the, in the 50s. And people were coming from all over the world uh, to, to catch these fish on rod and reel. And the method was you hook an alligator gar, hook yourself an eight foot alligator gar, you, you reel it into the boat 
and then somebody on the boat either shoots it with a bow and arrow or with a gun and, and that was that was the method of, of of bringing in tourism dollars from 1957 to 1959 and in those three years the whole breeding population of the state was wiped out and uh, the, the whole species was extirpated in Arkansas and after that the whole system really suffered um, the fish be, the system became anemic because you didn't have the top predators doing their top predator thing catfish had to move into that slot um, and uh, it's since then we've been doing a lot of um, outreach and work in Arkansas at the state and federal level, um, altering waterways to help them get to their spawning grounds. We've been stocking systems. We've been bringing the, and I've been involved in this, we've been bringing the alligator gar back. And, and, and mostly it's, um, it's, it has, it has, the alligator gar has made a, a comeback in Arkansas and in a lot of other Southern states where they were uh, extirpated from. They're even making a comeback now in some Northern states like Illinois, where they were once wiped out. So they're making a comeback. And, um, but the, the, the biggest reason they're making a comeback is because in order for them to spawn, they have to be able to get into flooded fields that have uh, the right plant life for them to attach their eggs to. And we've got a lot more precipitation now because of global warming. Um, when I first moved to Arkansas in 2007, uh, the gar, alligator gar were only spawning once every seven years. And just because they spawn, that doesn't mean that those fish are going to, those, those baby fish are going to live. There's, you know, it's only 4% only ever survive anyways, all the other fish that are trying to eat them. Um, so, oh, but now we are having major floods every year in the South and in the North. <laughs> and, uh, like in the last 10 years, there's been like four once in a hundred year floods in Arkansas. And there's been one once in a 500 year flood a couple of years ago. So there's the gar are getting into the spawning grounds a lot more. And uh, I have just seen their populations uh, explode. Um, now the rivers are, are full of juveniles. There, there's a lot going on. They're making a comeback. Um, I should say that Jeremy Wade here, you know, a lot of people have probably seen the show River Monsters. Um, he contacted me back in 2000 when I published a, a, a Garticle, an article on GAR online. And I, I, this was, you know, eight years before the show ever came on. And he said that um, he was putting together a documentary on alligator GAR and he wanted to work with me. And um, anyways, I shared my research with him. I, I was writing this book at the time and uh, I went to Texas to meet him and I brought him a copy of the book. And um, basically he stole my research. <laughs> and I mean, if you watch the fourth episode, the alligator gar episode, all the stuff that he tells you about alligator gar, he got it from me. Um, and I'm not complaining. I'm glad, I'm glad he did it. I mean, I, I got $200 from being on the show. <laughs> That and um, but most of all, I got I got a lot of messages out. If if you've seen that show, he basically puts the alligator gar on trial, and and then at the end judges that the gar is not uh, guilty of crimes against humanity. It's our, our, it's all about our own misunderstanding of the fish. So the fish um, is is not guilty, and. And this message get is you know he, he gets out to millions of people every day still because it's being rerun all over the world, and um, the attitude attitude toward alligator gar um, and gar in general, people are becoming more enlightened. 
Um, in Texas, where they, it's, it's always common to see a whole bunch of dead gar at boat launches. People like to show off their, the, the, the fish they kill. They just dump them there to stink everything up. That's, it's not happening as much as anymore. People are getting the message. They are not harmful. They are, that we need these fish in our systems. So, so the message is getting out and I'm glad for that. The mysterious American eel. These fish are the most mysterious fish on the planet. Nobody knows where they breed in the Sargasso Sea, but we're getting closer with tracking devices now. These fish sometimes travel 10,000 miles to spawn. They're, they have the largest range of any fish on the planet. The females will go inland on a continent and they'll stay there for 40 years in, until they reach breeding size. And then they'll come out and they'll meet the guys who are waiting for them in the, in the brackish water with the salt water. And um, then they'll go to the Sargasso Sea out there by the Bahamas or wherever it is, and they will breed. They, they go there and they, uh, the, the, the European eels also breed in the Sargasso Sea. They're the close cousins of the American eels. They look very similar. Um, in Europe, 99% of um, the, the European eel population has crashed. There's only 1% left. Here in the United States, um, the American eel still has 75% of its range left. So we're doing a little better. Um, dams are a major problem for these fish because they block migrations. They keep them from going upstream and downstream, but they also prevent, dams also prevent parasitic, parasitic nematodes from spreading uh, parasites. So dams are good and they're also bad. We're innovating with eel ladders now so that um, eels can bypass dams. Um, the big wild card in the mix, as with all species, is global warming. We're just not sure what the long-term long effects will be and how species will roll with the drastic changes we're heading for. The US Fish and Wildlife Service just completed a major study of this fish and uh, they determined that they are not at, at risk. Um, one, one thing I should say about this fish is they're all over the continent, especially here on the East Coast, very famous in the Hudson River, of course. I grew up in Minnesota. There, um, I never saw an eel there once in my life, but they're all, they're all over. They're all over the country. Nobody ever sees them. They're like phantoms. They, they, they're really sneaky. They're really hard to catch, um, but they're all over the place. Paddlefish. Um, this weirdo looking fish is a plankton eater with a cartilaginous skeleton. They can get well over six feet long and they're usually caught by snagging with the giant treble hooks. One of the problems this fish is facing is that their roe or their eggs are pretty close to sturgeon eggs. So poachers are illegally catching them in the United States and shipping their eggs back to Eastern Europe and Russia and our fisheries are paying the price here. Usually the bigger the species is, the harder it is for them to reproduce. And paddlefish are even are already having a hard time due to the damming of the river systems. They sense metal and they stay away from dams, which make it hard for them to migrate to their spawning grounds. In Missouri, where I caught this one, state and federal agencies knew that when they erected dams on the Osage River system, they would obstruct spawning. So nationwide, the deal is, if you build a dam, um, then you have to do other stuff to help the fish whose migrations you are hindering. Uh, so mostly with paddlefish, it's, it's stocking them and growing them in hatcheries and then putting them into the system because they're not having an easy time reproducing out there. Farming paddlefish was once thought to be impossible, but we've now got a handle on how to do it successfully. Milt, uh, the, mouth, the sperm and the roe are mixed together with a turkey feather in hatcheries in a bowl. And then the fry are raised in tanks. At the aquaculture facility I visited, the paddlefish are moved to golf course ponds when they reach a certain size. Then they're raised in those ponds until they 
reach a larger size. After a few years, the golf course owners are paid a price per pound for the paddlefish that they raise. And then those paddlefish are released into the wild or used for scientific research. Um, in fact, there's a possibility that paddlefish might be used to cure cancer. Um, these fish are also really tasty. <laughs> Anybody know that fish? Yeah. Yes, sturgeon, right? <laughs> this is the largest one I ever caught in my life. Uh, eight foot one, 250 pounds. The white sturgeon is the largest freshwater fish on the continent. Back in the 1800s, they reportedly used to reach lengths of 20 feet. Now, however, the maximum length for a wild sturgeon is about 14 feet. I caught this one on the Snake River in Idaho, and we caught two others in the seven foot range. There's a lot of mythology regarding sturgeon wherever they are. In the case of the white sturgeon, there are all these rumors about this farmer and he caught this big fish and the fish was so big that he had to go hook his mule team up. And the fish was so huge that it pulled the mule team and the wagon and everything into the river and no more mules. <laughs> This is a, a, a myth that seems to get repeated a lot of places where sturgeon swim in different forms. Um, white sturgeon have been having a hard time on this continent, mostly due to demand for caviar. In the 1890s, the demand was so high and the fishing so commercialized that the entire species crashed and they almost went extinct. We've been trying to recover from that uh, for over a century, but during that time, the world has gone from 5,000 large industrial dams to 50,000 large industrial dams, most of which block migrations out to the ocean, thereby trapping populations from fresh water when they're used to going out to salt water and coming back like salmon. So um, with the Columbia River system in Washington State, between Washington State and uh, Oregon, that river is full of sturgeon and it goes out to Idaho and then it goes up into Montana and then up into Canada. And there's so many dams in that system. These fish used to swim over a thousand miles, you know, to, to get from Canada out to the ocean. Now they can't do that anymore. Um, so, because the dams just block their migration. So there's fish in those systems that are over a hundred years old and, um, we have to keep adding uh, fish that were raised in hash trees because they cannot reproduce. Um, because when dams are erected, this affects water temperature and sedimentation. The bottom changes and sturgeon lose the structure they need to spawn. Uh, so it's tough out there for a sturgeon. Um, but they're being, raised in, they're being raised in hatcheries, like I said, they're being stocked in the systems. Um, these fish do not do well with fish ladders like salmon do. And another thing that's happening is that sea lions are getting more aggressive and they're coming further and further inland and they're eating the sturgeon because there's way less salmon in the rivers than there used to be. So it's a slow going process. Anyways, um, I don't wanna to talk too much longer because uh, I've already talked for an hour and I'm a teacher and I know that people get restless after an hour. <laughs> so I'm willing to answer any other questions if there's anybody that's got anything, yeah. Mark, you mentioned in your discussion of eels and eel ladder. Right. How does an eel ladder differ from a typical fish ladder that you might have around the dam, like you were saying, for salmon? Any salmon? Right. Well, um, yes. So the salmon eel ladders are sort of like steps, yeah. and 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 the fish go from one level to another level, and they can get over a dam. Eel ladders are a little different. Um, basically, what an eel ladder is is it's a big hose. It's a tube, and there's there's stuff inside like mesh, like netting that the that they can climb on. And so like, um, basically these, the eels will go to a dam and they'll search around it. They're just looking for anywhere where they, where they find water coming out of the dam. 
And, um, and so these tubes are set up and the, the, the eels sense the water coming out of the tubes. They go in the tubes, they work their way up. And uh, that's working pretty good. Um, hatcheries are also um, uh, bypassing dams just like by, by grazing eels and um, just driving them beyond the dam and letting them go. And uh, eels, they have an amazing lifespan. Like they're, they're called elvers at one point when they're really small. And then they're called glass eels at another point when they're a certain length. And they can, they can actually, they're really good at like just crawling straight up concrete. They can just wiggle their way up. <laughs> so, yeah, but the, yeah. Um, I've never caught one, but I have seen eels caught in the Wapentish Creek. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, what way above Wapentish. There, there's no way that the eels can get from, you know, say Pleasant Valley, mm -hmm. you know, to, to the Hudson River to get to, uh, to the ocean. So, I'm wondering what the deal is with those. Are they somehow able to reproduce in the in the creek, or huh. so they're landlocked? They they, they yeah. can't. Yeah. Or is it maybe somebody just had them and let them go? Though? Well, I don't think they can reproduce because those are all females. Because the the females come inland, and then the males stay out. So those are probably not going to be reproducing populations. <laughs> you know, I say it like like see like they were seeing dogs from all these creeks where all those dogs are. Where they go from the DC to catch the glass seal and the counter. So they go right up the Hudson, right into the water of the street, and then all the way up through there. We actually tell them they can get up there over the over the Rockwood Fall. They, they get up through all those individual little things. We actually put them up there. We actually get them back and bring them up to the uh, little tributaries, like that marsh, like um, down by, uh, this is where a bunch of high school is, and it gets in those little, those little waterways and makes its way into the creek that way as well. So they form their way in there. But we actually found one, believe it or not, we were uh, fishing up in uh, Monk Island at the top of Catfield outside of Roscoe. And we were at a high elevation, we found an eel up there. Yeah. One was way over up there, believe it or not. Wow. Yeah, that's crazy. Is that in uh, connection with the Spouser report? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This guy was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Any other? Questions, comments? This is an observation. In the recent issue of uh, Fly Fisherman magazine, there was a whole article about fly fishing for snakeheads oh. in the Chesapeake area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right, yeah, yeah, the, um, yeah. They're there, they're there, and um, they're they're not they're not decimating all the other fish as feared. And we're actually and. Um, that's what we got to do, actually, is we got to come up with creative solutions, uh, you know, invent new sports for, for people. Um, um, let me just show you one thing here. Um, this, this fish is a, a burbot. We have them here in, uh, in New York State. They're basically all along this latitude that goes across the top of the United States and around the globe. They're in all the countries like Russia and Europe. And um, they're an invasive species. They're a top predator. They could do a lot of the destruction to other species. Um, someone dumped them out in um, the Flaming Gorge system on, on the Green River in uh, Utah and Wyoming. And uh, they took, they started populating there. And th uh, the Flaming Gorge uh, Reservoir is um, is shared by by both Wyoming and Utah, and they have a lot of trout and salmon up there, and a big sport fishing industry, and um, and then all of a sudden they've got this invasive species that's eating their trout and salmon, and the people are freaking out because um, this is this is their livelihood, the tourism, the fishing, their sports, their natural heritage, their identity. And now they got these things, and and so now so what they decided to do was they they set up this this fishing tournament called the Burbot Bash, and it happens twice a year, and um, in the winter it's ice fishing, and in the summer people go out in boats, and there are prizes for the biggest burbot caught, 
for the, um, the smallest burbot cot, for the most burbot cot. And, um, and it's turned into a, a regular um, event. And basically what happens is every time they have this event, they remove 4,000 of these fish from the system. And uh, oh wait, maybe it's, I'm not sure, but they, they, they remove 4% of the fish from the system. I can't. Anyways, they remove enough from the system that the trout and the salmon can remain strong fisheries. So now, so there, this is an example of, of, of what to do with invasive species of creative solutions, you know. I mean, this is an excellent tasting fish. In fact, one of the ways to cook it is, is, is a, a poor man's lobster recipe. You boil it and seven up and then you dip it in melted butter. <laughs> um, for some reason, the, the sweetness of the seven up, I don't know. This, it's, it's important to have sweet water to boil them in for some reason. But um, yeah, so, but now the thing is, oh wait, yeah. So yeah, I think that we're gonna have a lot more invasive species coming on in the, in the coming decades. Uh, we just we need to come up with creative solutions like the burbot bash um, to make a lemonade, basically. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, um, I'm I'm going to be up here. I'll sign some books if anybody wants any. Um, if you want to come up and talk or have any other questions or comments, I'd love to hear them. Thank and you. thank you, Yvonne. Yeah. All right. <laughs>